This is a mechanism of disease map for pituitary adenoma. I'll be defining pituitary adenoma and then talking about the etiologies and the manifestations. Like with all of these mechanism of disease maps, the key is up here at the top right, and each of the boxes will be color-coded according to which of these core concepts it represents. So let's start by defining a pituitary adenoma. It's a well-circumscribed benign tumor of the endocrine gland located in the cella tersica in the middle cranial fossa. Histologically, it's monomorphic with, poly with polygonal cells arranged in sheets or cords, and there's no connective tissue or reticulin. Now, it's helpful to remember that normally the pituitary has two parts, an anterior pituitary and a posterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary secretes a handful of hormones, including ACTH, TSH, LH, FSH, GH, MSH, and prolactin. The posterior pituitary secretes only ADH and oxytocin. And these will be relevant when we talk about how this affects the pituitary function. So as I mentioned, we'll talk about the etiology and the manifestations, the things that lead to pituitary adenomas, and then the result of pituitary adenomas. The etiologies can be broken down into sporadic, which make up the vast majority of cases, over 90%, and genetic and familial etiologies, which are a small minority at 5%. Sporadic mutations are activating mutations, usually in the GNAS gene. This then triggers the activation of the signal transduction pathway via the GS protein, which results in increased levels of cyclic AMP. That then increases the mit mitotic activity of the pituitary cell, which creates a pituitary adenoma. Now, of the genetic and familial conditions, there are two or three here, but the one that's most important to know is multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1. That's MEN type 1. And it's associated with a few other conditions in addition to pituitary adenoma. But essentially, there's a mutation in the MEN1 gene, which is on chromosome 11, which leads to altered expression of the menin protein. And that, again, causes pituitary adenoma. These are lower yield, but there's also familial isolated pituitary adenoma syndrome, which is a mutation in the AIP gene, which directly causes pituitary adenoma. There's also this condition called Carney complex, where you have a loss of function mutation in the PRKARA1 gene, which encodes the regulatory subunit of protein kinase A. This brings you back down to this protein cascade where it increases the levels of cyclic AMP which then increases the mitotic activity of the pituitary cell to create a pituitary adenoma. But again, the most important genetic cause of pituitary adenoma is this MEN type 1. Now that we know the etiology, we can talk about the manifestations of pituitary adenoma. These adenomas can be broken down into non-secretory and secretory pituitary adenomas. The secretory pituitary adenomas are, of course, going to cause hyperpituitarism, which is a long list of hormones that can affect the body in various ways. Before we talk about that, let's talk about what the non-secretary pituitary adenoma can do. This usually affects the rest of the body and manifests due to its mass effect. This is when the compression, when the, when the tumor itself gets big enough to compress or displace adjacent structures. Now again, this structure is located in the cella tersica and there are some very delicate things around it. So when those things get affected, you'll have manifestations of the pituitary adenoma. So of course it can cause headache, your, increase intra, your increasing intracranial pressure, and that can be painful. It can also compress the optic chiasm. These are the optic nerves that cross right in front of the pituitary adenoma. And this can result in a bitemporal hemianopsia. It's when you can't see the lateral parts of your vision. It's worth looking at an optic nerve map to see how those parts of the retina map to the optic nerves and how those pass and cross right at the optic chiasm. And it makes sense that if a pituitary is enlarged, such as due to an adenoma, you'll have a disruption of the optic chiasm and that'll result in, an, in a bitemporal hemianopsia. Now, of course, it's also possible for the secretary pituitary adenoma to cause this mass effect. And they can also have headaches and this bitemporal hemianopsia. It's uh, more, it's, so that's, that's one possible effect. The other effect that we need to talk about are the hyperpituitarism conditions, and those are listed here. I'll talk about them one by one. So first, if you have a cell that produces prolactin that is 
increased in mitotic activity that becomes an adenoma, you have a prolactinoma. This is also called a lactotroph adenoma, and it's the most common kind of pituitary adenoma. You'll notice here hyperprolactinemia, so you'll be able to see that on a blood test. And you can also have reduced bone density due to suppression of estrogen. So that might also appear on a bone scan as well. Other signs and symptoms include galactorrhea, amenorrhea, and reduced libido and infertility. Oftentimes in men, the only symptom you'll have is reduced libido and infertility because, of course, men might not have galactorrhea or amenorrhea. Next is a, uh, a somatroph adenoma. This is about 10 to 15 percent of secretory pituitary adenomas. You'll have an increase in growth hormone on your blood tests, and this results in acromegaly or gigantism. Next is corticotroph adenoma. This is essentially Cushing's disease when you have a pituitary adenoma that creates a lot of ACTH, and this is secondary hypercortisolism. So you'll be able to identify it that way on the blood test. Now, of course, Cushing's disease has a variety of symptoms throughout the body. Some of them are listed here. So it affects the skin. The patient might have bruises, stretchy skin, like stretch marks on the abdomen, um, hirsutism, delayed wound healing, Patient might also have anxiety, depression, low libido, amenorrhea, and bone fractures. You might also notice osteopenia on a bone scan, as well as insulin resistance and secondary hypertension. Next is a thyrotroph adenoma, which is when the pituitary adenoma secretes TSH, which results in secondary hyperthyroidism. You'll have your classic symptoms of hyperthyroidism, including heat tolerance, frequent bowel movements, sweating, weight loss, pre-tibial myxedema, lid lag, tachycardia, palpitations, hypertension, tremor, anxiety, and hyperreflexia. Lastly, you can have a gonadotroph adenoma, which is a more rare cause of uh, pituitary adenoma. Sorry, a more rare manifestation of pituitary adenoma. In these patients, they'll have increased LH and FSH, and usually these increases aren't that um, severe to cause any signs or symptoms. So the patient won't really have many signs and symptoms from the gonadotroph adenoma. Now to make matters more complicated, if you have a mass effect in the cella tersica from a pituitary adenoma, it could be a non-secretory or a secretory, any of these, you can also compress the other parts of the pituitary and result in a hypopituitarism. So essentially you're overproducing any of these hormones, and it's taking up all the space and resources of the rest of the pituitary. So you can also have deficiencies in all of these hormones, and the result of those are listed here. So in hypopituitarism, if you have a GH deficiency, the patient will have short stature if it happens during childhood. They might also have weight gain, weakness, and depression. If you have prolactin deficiency, a mother might have lactation failure after delivery. If you have FSH or LH deficiency, a woman might have amenorrhea, irregular periods, infertility, or delayed puberty. Men might have a low libido, testicular atrophy, loss of facial, axillary, or pubic hair, and gynecomastia. A TSH deficiency essentially causes hypothyroidism, which has the classic symptoms of weight gain, cold intolerance, lethargy, constipation, and dry skin. ACH, sorry, ACTH deficiency or adrenal insufficiency will cause weight loss, weakness, hypotension, chronic hyponatremia, and hypoglycemia. Notice that a lot of these are the opposite of what you would see in Cushing's disease and thyrotroph adenoma for these TSH deficiencies and ACTH deficiencies. Lastly, if you have an ADH deficiency, that's essentially central diabetes insipidus, and the patient might have polyuria and polydipsia. They'll be peeing a lot and they'll be drinking a lot of water. So it's kind of confusing that the same pituitary adenoma, or not, not necessarily the same pituitary adenoma, but the same condition, the pituitary adenoma, can manifest in so many different ways. They can secrete any of these hormones. They can grow to become so large that they prevent the secretion of any of these hormones. So it really has a very various way of manifesting itself. This has been a mechanism of disease map for pituitary adenoma. I hope it was helpful, and thank you for listening.